All right, recording. Yeah, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of September 6, 2022, Gordon noting that we do have a quorum of the committee present. And uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is being conducted by a, by a remote means. Um, and uh, with that, I want to um, make sure that all of the uh, members of the committee can um, confirm that they are hearing me and that we can hear them. So I'll just go through um, Lynn. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. I'm here. <clears throat> uh, just so everybody knows, Matt uh, is not, Holloway is not going to be with us today. Um, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Uh, Michelle Miller. Here. And Kathy Shane. Here. And Alicia Walker. Here. Okay, so we have a um, quorum present. And uh, there are two major items for discussion today. And so I want to uh, um, kind of get the committee's agreement um, as to the order that we're going to take them in. And um, I am going to propose that we do the library but, um, project but, and do that item first and then do the regional school method guardrail discussion second. Um, but I wanted to make sure that um, any members of the committee who would um, prefer that we not go in that order um, can make that um, concise us so, Please raise your hand if um, you um, object to that order. Um, so seeing none, what I would also like to do is, um, I had said that I would, any members of um, the trustees who are present, as long as we didn't get to a quorum of the um, trustees, that we would bring them into the room. I think that Sharon is already present as a staff member. As I look at the list, that is um, Bob Pam and um, Lee Edwards. I don't think that, the, I, I know that there's two people who are identified only by phone numbers. Um, so if, uh, anybody that I've missed, um, who's a member of the trustees is present, but I haven't recognized the name raised, please raise your hand just so I know. And if not, I would ask that whoever's controlling, yes, Michelle before. Could you just say how folks who are coming in by phone can raise their hand, please? In case there is a trustee that's coming in by phone. Um, is it star something or other? Uh, Athena's a star nine. I'm trying to remember. Yes, it's star nine. So it is star nine. Um, okay, so we have one more. Um, so Andy, you want you want us to, you um, you want me to bring them into the room? Yeah, I have one question. Um, it is my understanding of the open meeting law, and the, this is probably another Athena question, that a quorum of a body is um, when you get to a majority, it's a six member board of trustees. And um, so three would not constitute a, uh, would not constitute a quorum. If that's wrong, then we have a problem because it was not posted as a meeting of the trustees. I believe you're correct. Right. But do we know? I mean, if we don't know that there's not going to be four, then it'd be difficult no, to, st it, to start and then stop. Yes. If it is uh, Lee, Bob, and the person who's raised their hand who we can't identify, then I would think we're okay. All right, so do you want me to bring them into the room? Yes, and uh, let's see if the person who can identify. Um, 
raise their hand and can identify themselves once they're in. So, um, Athena, do you, uh, how do I bring a phone number into the room, Athena? It's not giving me the option when I am. Um... You can't, you can, you can allow them to talk, but you can't bring them in as a panelist unless they join using a panelist. Um, okay, so just ID number. click allow to talk. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the phone number, could you raise your hand again one more time um, if you're a trustee? Star nine. Okay. So we have Bob. Um, whoever is 413-658-8312, could you identify yourself? Hi, this is Alex Lafave. Hi, Alex. Um, and I'm trying to let Lee in, uh, but she's got to accept it in order to come in. Okay, so Lee is present, so uh, Sharon, share. do you, Sharon, do you know if Austin is planning to join? No, okay. Yeah, I think he was teaching today, so he was yes. unavailable. So um, if one more member of the trustees shows up, then we do have a problem because this was not posted as a trustees meeting. So going then to the next step, um, I'm going to be very, I, here are the okay. three things that we want to accomplish today in this discussion, and then I'm going to, I, I see that both Bob and Lee have hands up, so, but let, let's, uh, let me just explain what's going on. The first, I, what we want to do, because we have members of the council and the committee who are not members of the council and the committee in 2021 when we took the original vote. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just explaining the original decision that was made by the council and uh, let, so that everybody can understand what, what the original decision was and how we came to that decision. Uh, and then the second part, and uh, I certainly will be calling on other members of the committee uh, who were um, members of the, in, in involved in that decision to help out with that discussion and see if there are questions from um, counselors who are not members of that original um, group of counselors who wish to ask questions about that. So that's one. Two is that we that Sean is then going to make a presentation to start us off on a discussion about what has changed um, since then, which I think we've all been hearing about and reading about and was part of the presentation that Sean made in the previous finance committee meeting, but um, he's gonna make a little bit more uh, pre presentation as to how it um, has factored in. And um, the third is then um, recognizing that today is an informational meeting. We are not going to be taking any uh, votes or recommending anything to the council um, at this meeting. This is really a learning opportunity for the committee. We want to identify information that the Finance Committee will need for later meetings and that we think that the um, council will need in order to make decisions that it may make in the future. And uh, uh, Lynn had um, begun to work on a list of questions that um, could be posed that would identify that information. And so for that third part of the meeting, um, she is going to um, lead us through a discussion of the dr current draft of the questions um, to see if there are additional questions that um, we as a finance committee would like to see um, added to that list. So that's um, what I envision as the three parts of today's meeting. So um, we're not gonna be actually um, having the discussion about what are the next steps that the council may need to make, 
because that's down the line and if you saw Lynn's email about what she envisions for the council that um, the next step is for the council to have a similar informational discussion that probably will not be um, as complete as we're able to do in a committee meeting. Um, so Lynn, do I do you, do you think that I have stated it correctly as far as what you envisioned for today? Yes. And by the way, Lee Edwards seems to be back in the audience. Do you all let our uh, staff take care of it? So I'm going to just very, um, very briefly begin by set, by pointing out uh, one thing. If if I'm able to share my screen, um, I'm going to do so. Um, and let's see if I. Let's see if I can get to what I want on the screen, which in what I'm going to try and put up is very simply um, this, the order that was passed by the last council. And I'm not going to go through the whole, trying to go through the whole thing in part, but as you can see that um, it was that the town appropriate an amount of money that is listed as here is 35 million. $279,700 for the purpose of the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library. The key part of it that I wanted to point out is in the bottom section um, that's in this box, and that is the anticipated funding sources, because um, this is where the council really comes into it, that the amount is broken into essentially four parts, but uh, one of them is um, the uh, is actually excluded from the thirty five million two seventy nine because that's a million dollars that is the Community Preservation Act funding, which was a separate vote at the same council meeting. The amount of 30 um, that is actually being borrowed is then um, that is the amount that was at the beginning of 35,279,700 is broken into three pieces. The MBLC, the Massachusetts uh, Board of Library Commissioners grant, the amount that the uh, Jones Library trustees were committing to raise in funds through donations. And then the town local share, which is 15751810. And that becomes important uh, because what, the, uh, what we realized at the time was that there were substantial uh, work that needed to be done on the Jones Library because a lot of maintenance had not been pursued for um, several years because we uh, were anticipating that this project was going to be coming to us and uh, the uh, library uh, got, uh, obtained the help of Coon Riddle Architectural Firm to look at um, how um, to most effectively complete the renovations that would need to be done um, if we uh, were not pursuing a library project that needed to address the critical needs of the library. And the amounts, and they ended up coming up with two approaches to take in order to do that. And one, and there were options one and two, and the two options totaled a cost of $16.8 million or $14.4 million. And um, it depended upon um, how many stages the work was divided on. Um, and uh, so what we were looking at was an amount of money it would ultimately have to come from the town anyway to assist 
through the uh, process uh, that is done through the Joint Capital Planning Committee that was approximately equal to the um, local share. And, you know, the, the uh, council uh, looked at that comparison and that was a large, that was a part of the decision. And I think that that's why we decided that it was important that we um, uh, not have that, that we make the decision that we made. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And um, I see Kathy has already raised her hand. But um, what I'd like to do is focus for a couple minutes on other members of the committee who were present at the time um, who made the decision about why uh, the committee made the uh, and the council made the decision uh, to recommend and to adopt this uh, plan, the original plan, and questions from other councillors about it, and then um, that will complete step one. So, Kathy. Okay, uh, just a quick comment, Andy. I thought what you just did was extremely clear, but um, on the whether you call it option B, but it was the what if we just uh, repaired. Uh, and did ABDA. I just wanted the new councillors to know that um, when we talked about town share, we never uh, noted that it might be possible to get CPA money too. So when you looked at the one that was the renovation and re expand, there's a part that's coming from property tax and there's another million from CPA. CPA was a zero on the the just repair option. So just on the same grid. So when you said 14 million, there wasn't another million from CPA. If there had been, it would have been 13 million. So it, it's just it's just a comment on uh, that because that option wasn't as fully developed. I mean, we cl clearly didn't have a CPA grant in hand. Um, they had applied. So it was just a comment on what was an alternative to that led to the other decision. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I want to step back for a moment and make sure that as you look at the presentation that uh, I sent to you just yesterday, and I apologize for that, I was waiting to confer with Andy, uh, that this, the history of getting to where we are today goes back many years. It goes back to a preliminary grant that was applied for to the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. That was a planning grant. It then went to saying, okay, let's see, let's see what the full proposal would look like. And that was submitted. Both of those were voted on by town meeting. And then in the process, it came to the council because we transitioned to the council form of government. And so, as Andy mentioned, there were three votes that night on April 4th, 2021. One was the CPA money, but it's conditional upon getting the grant. The second was the actual authorization to borrow, which is the one Andy put up on the screen. And the third one regards the memo between the town and the Board of Library Commissioners with regard to fundraising and making the fundraising whole by the end of the project. So as we look at this, I wanted to just make sure people understood this didn't just come up in 2021. I believe it goes back to 2015 or 16. That's all in the slides we sent to you earlier. Um, that's all, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, for pointing out the uh, wealth of materials that um, you provided in that email to the entire council to try and set the factual background of the entire project. Uh, as, uh, as we continue to complete this first part of the discussion as to the original decision and how we came to it, if there's anything that um, Sharon or um, a trustee who's present want to add, you know, please raise your hand too, because uh, uh, 
uh, you guys were as involved with it, or a lot more involved with it than we were. And uh, then I also, if there are questions from um, counselors uh, about the original decision, the information that you would like, please raise your hand too, because I want this to be an open discussion. And if not, if people are comfortable with uh, the basic understanding of how we got to where we are, then um, yes, Michelle. Just making sure that the phone number that's in the room, um, that their hand raise function works um, the same way that ours does. And maybe if we could just ask that person if, if it's Alex, right? If Alex it's would like, Alex. yeah. I have a feeling that pretend, that it may not be working. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Andy, can you hear me? This is Alex. Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. I'm trying to raise my hand, but I'm on my phone and I'm I'm Zoom deficient on a phone, so I apologize. Um. I, I just wanted to to clarify two things that I heard. Um, so uh, one, as Kathy rightly pointed out, the repair options that were pursued um, don't reflect CPA funding. Um, they don't reflect any possible funding. And the reason for that is those estimates um, were requested by the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And what was requested was not an option B in the sense that if the project doesn't go forward, we have a plan. What was requested was what are the urgent items that need repairing in order for the library to continue to operate and to be and to operate safely. And so those numbers were gotten from Western Builders, which then triggered uh, an accessibility threshold for the ADA, which is what Tune Riddle did. So we're unable to find out if there's CPAC funding or any other funding because that's literally just if you were to call a contractor and say, you know, how much is it to, you know, replace my stove, um, but I still know I have to remodel my entire kitchen. So those numbers were a baseline for things that need fixing. If the project were not to proceed, we would actually have to go back and we would have to have design work done around, let's say we only fix the HVAC system. We would have to hire you know, an engineer to look at that system to redesign the system. So the number is likely a higher number. Those were just sort of baseline. So we, you, we couldn't go to you know, CPAC or to anyone else to find out what additional funding might be available because that's not really a plan. It's just a, a starting point based on what was requested from JCPC. Uh, Bob? <clears throat> just a couple of points to, to be clear on the time frame. Um, I think it's almost 10 years since uh, we originally started talking about this. I think we were approved by the Board of Library Commissioners in 2017. What we didn't know when they approved us was that we would be number nine on the list and it would take three years or four years before we would actually get to the top of it. So had we known then what we know now, uh, things, you know, it might have been different, but in any case, you know, if we had been at the top of the list, you know, by now it would have been done and over. So it's just further information about the sequences. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or uh, comments about the original decision and which is sort of the first step? Because if not, then I would, uh, um, ask Sean to take over for a moment because he has um, given some thought about how to present um, where we are now. And um, Sean? Sure, I'm going to share my screen. 
And if you could just let me know when you see my screen. I see your screen. Okay, thank you. All right, so sorry, too fast. Um, just a few terms before we look at a couple charts. Um, so in the chart, you'll see approved budget. So all that means is the amount of funding that the council has approved so far. Um, again, the council approved, you know, between two different debt authorizations, they approved the whole budget um, between the CPA authorization and then the other one. Um, you'll see reconciled cost estimate. So uh, the library has a cost estimator, Fennessy, and the town has a cost estimator, RLB. They each did independent cost estimates and then came to, uh, and those cost estimates were of hard costs, um, which you'll see a definition of in a second, um, but it's basically construction costs. Those two estimates were reconciled, which essentially was taking the midpoint of each of them. One was higher, one was lower, and they took the midpoint. Um, to get to a sort of reconciled hard cost estimate. We then added in sort of a, a placeholder for soft costs, which you'll see the definition of, definition of in a second, um, to get to a total reconciled cost estimate for the, the full project. Uh, project is comprised of hard costs and soft costs. Um, so hard costs are basically construction and any related uh, work such as site work, um, uh, things that would be part of the bid when we open up construction bids. Um, soft costs include things like furniture and fixtures, technology equipment, um, our fees for project management and designers, um, any estimates or surveys that are being done, the, the commissioning and testing that would have to happen afterwards. Um, it includes contingencies, permits, and, and things like that. And also with this project, it includes relocation and temporary space costs. Any questions on terminology before I show the charts? Because it's, I want to make sure it's not confusing before we uh, look at them. Okay, I don't see any hands. So this first uh, chart is looking at project costs. So our proof budget was 36.3 million. That was comprised of 26.9 million of hard costs and 9.4 million of soft costs. Um, roughly, soft costs were roughly 35% of, uh, of the hard costs. Um, and then with the reconciled cost estimate, when we add in um, we use that same percentage. And so just so people know, there could be some, some give there. We haven't had a, an independent estimate of soft costs. We've only had the independent cost estimates of hard costs. Um, but if we take that same percentage of 35% and apply it to the new, um, the new estimates that we have for hard costs, you get a reconciled cost estimate um, of about 51 million. And then we have included some scope reductions at the joint labor, or not the joint labor, the uh, Jones Library uh, Building Committee um, has have been reviewing. Um, there's about 1.7 million of scope reductions or, or value engineering type reductions that the committee has looked at already. Um, so those are included and to get to that $49.3 million number. Um, so again, that's a combination of hard costs and soft costs, and it also includes um, some value engineering reductions that the committee has looked at. And we'll say that those aren't necessarily all the way approved yet, but um, we did want to be included them for this uh, discussion. And then the last slide, keeping it simple, is the funding side of that. So the, as Andy mentioned, um, you'll see the approved budget was made up of a CPA grant for a million dollars. An MBLC grant for 13.9 million, the town share was 15.8, and the leftover for the trustees and fundraising was 5.6. So if we roll this forward now with the, um, the new total project budget um, with CPA staying the same, the MBLC grant staying the same, the town share staying the same, that increases the trustee share to 18.6. And that's it, very simple, that's where we are. Okay, so I guess the uh, questions about uh, what you've seen and through the chance presented and then we where we go is the next step beyond that. Kathy. Um, just a quick, uh, it's kind of a question and Sharon and others might remember on the original budget, the first column, um, when we were trying to get a, a grasp of the total, since as Bob said, when you were approved, you were thinking when you first projected it that we were gonna be building it in 2019, and then you had to escalate the cost to 2021. But my memory is to 
get to the 36, you had to cut the furnishing by about half. Um, I can go back and check my notes. So the soft costs had already cut furnishing by quite a bit. Is that true? I'm just I'm just looking when when I now look at the soft costs in the new one that we'd already cut back. Um, my these are my memories that you cut the contingency fee quite a bit. You cut the OPM fee, the architect fee, and the furniture um, allocation, and that allowed you to come to a 36 million price tag that was pretty much where it had been when you, you know, to, because inflation had happened. So the actual building of the building had gone up and you knew we're trying to stay within the total. So I'm really just focused on the furniture right now. We'd already cut a big chunk out of it. And I just want to make sure that's an accurate statement. There were definitely cuts, but I don't remember what we, uh, what we actually cut. I'd have to go and look. Okay. You know, as I said, we had it because you had a nice line which showed where you got the pieces of money from um, on the furnishing. Because we, we were worried we were going to open a new expanded library with no furniture. And you said there's some left. <laughs> but, you know, so thanks. Yeah, Michelle? If this is the right time, Andy, would it be possible to get uh, an approximate update on the fundraising so far? some estimated amounts? I think that um, I'm gonna see what, um, Lynn, did you wanna put that off till the next meeting or? Yeah, I, I think what we need to focus on today, Michelle, is asking all of the questions that we want answers to. And then we need to establish another finance committee meeting, if possible, this coming week which gives the trustees time to, and Sharon time to assemble those, even though Kent Farber is in the audience and he's clearly been part of that fundraising. Okay, so I have a question related to fundraising, but I'll hold it until you take questions at the end. Okay. Okay, I'm looking to see from the, um, Trying to figure out what to do with council members. I know that because I noticed that Dorothy has her yeah. end up too, but I'll come back to what to do for a second. Kathy? Andy, Andy if you want to recognize councilors, then you should uh, open a period of public comment. Yeah, okay. That's a good, we can do that. Um, but Kathy, do you have your um, yeah, so it's it's a question. It's actually what I've read in the newspapers or what I read in uh, maybe one of the committee reports that um, that we're at a point where to get to the point where you would go out and actually have contractors bidding on it, we would have to spend a million and a half to two million more on the schematic design and the detail work. So is is that number correct? Um, so I just wanted to get a sense of that and. And and then what's the time? What's the timing of that? Um, and the one thing I saw was, you know, all of the spring. So you'd have that done for maybe bidding in May or June. And and I'm just asking for the two because I'm I think as people know I'm chair of the elementary school building project, and um, we're on. We we weren't on the same timelines, but we're now on similar timelines in terms of uh, uh, of numbers. So so we're, we're not at that point yet where we would actually get contractors bidding at it is my question. And then we have to spend what I read, I think was a million and a half to two million mm -hmm. more before we would get to that, which um, at that point, we may be at the numbers we've just seen Sean put up on the board. And is it okay if I take a first crack at that? Um, yeah, so that those that estimate is right. We have to pay the designer and the OPM to bring us through design development, which is the phase, our next phase that we would head into. into. Um, and then after that, we would have to go through con the construction document phase where they would put the, the bid ready documents together. And then we'd have to go out to bid. Um, and so there's, there's costs associated with each of those phases and whatever, however much work they do in each of those phases, we would be liable for. 
and I and Sharon, unless you've seen something different, my understanding is yeah, it's summer of 2023 is when the the bidding would happen. And Sean, was I right on the million and a half to two million in that? In yeah, that? yep, yep, yep. Okay. I believe the estimate was a million four, but you know, there's some play in all of those numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the low, I can do a, a, a different low end, Bob. <laughs> More than a million to as much as. <laughs> See questions from Alicia and uh, Michelle. So, Alicia. Um, thank you. I have the same question as Michelle in regards to where we are with the fundraising, um, but also just a little bit further as to what the plan for the rest of the fundraising is, if there is one. Um, for the trustees. And then I have a question that maybe uh, Andy or Sean might know. Um, if we don't reach the fundraising goals, then what would be the course of action then? Um, Lynn, that's partly in the current memorandum of understanding. And um, so you're going to speak to that, but I think that it also we are getting into um, a very important part, which you're going to lead us through in a few minutes, which is uh, getting to the questions that we want to pose so that the library uh, trustees and staff have an opportunity to provide the information in an organized fashion to enable us to continue this discussion in our next meeting. Um, is there anything? I I would suggest that Paul or Sean would be the most appropriate people to discuss the present MOU and any changes. Paul? Yeah, so previously, um, the fundraising commitment by the trust by the trustees uh, was backstopped by the trustees endowment that they had said, they, and so that was the guarantee for the town. Um, in terms of what the commitment by the trustees was. With this new number, that's the part of the discussion we have to engage in now and, uh, in terms of it, does the entire amount of the increased expected costs come from the trustees and fundraising? Um, I mean, it could be the council wants to put more money into the project. It could be a, a number of, di of different variables that we, will, we can try to outline in the future for you. Uh, in terms of how we meet this new uh, challenge of the $49 million budget. Did Michelle, that help? Just a, a follow-up on a previous question. So as it stands right now, who is responsible for that cost of mm -hmm. one to 1 1.6 million to get us to bid? Which would be the next step that we would be pursuing? Who is responsible for that cost right now? Paul? So that would be the town being responsible for that if we choose to move forward. But um, our habit is that we make sure that we have a strong funding plan before we make, take the next significant step. And that's what that's why we're having this conversation and why um, Andy is seeking questions and that we can seek additional clarification on from the trustees and from the fundraisers so we know where we are in that whole sort of funding strategy. Okay. Yeah, I, I, again, um, if it seems a little bit confusing in process, I think that what we were kind of realizing is that I was thinking through this meeting and talking with others about it is that this is an extraordinarily complex issue. I think much more complex than we've dealt with in, the, in any previous discussion. And it was therefore it seemed appropriate to break this over two meetings and not to try and accomplish it in one meeting. And that's why um, I had come up with this proposal as to how to proceed. And uh, so we are moving towards that, um, trying to make sure that we are prepared for the next meeting. So, um, you know, with that in mind, let's continue. Bernie? Just a question about the grant, where we stand with the grant, if there's been any, dis um, and I've, I've sort of, I admit I've lost track of it. Um, has been any award made to the town? Has there been any disbursement from the grant to date? I just noticed that uh, 
In terms of the schematic design cost uh, analysis, there's a note here that uh, 2.7 uh, million would have to be uh, returned from grant disbursement number one. Yeah, it was okay, Andy, if I respond, start and yes. Sharon, if you wanna add anything. Um, so we have received the first payment. Um, there's different milestones that as you hit them, you get, uh, you get paid a fifth essentially of it. Um, the first one I think was just signing the contract. So we have received the first one that's been put into an interest bearing account um, as required by the MBLC. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's accumulating interest that can be put towards the project. But as, as the note says, um, that assumes a, su a successful project. So if it, the project doesn't move forward, that money plus interest would have to be repaid. Sean, how much did, how much was that first payment? Um, I think it was about 2.8 or uh, I can get you an exact number. I don't want to guess. So well, the, the number that's in the hand, it was uh, 2.7 million. Okay. And, and I, you, you also just mentioned that, yeah, we can, we'd have to return any interest we earned on that. Alicia. Um, what is our timeline with this decision in terms of, um, I, cause I think Paul said that we would want to make this decision before we, um, put the design out to bid. And so what is that? date oh. so there is no fixed date but time is of the essence because the longer we wait construction costs continue to escalate at a significant um, level so the longer we wait the more expensive this continues to grow um, so we want to be uh, have a decision made expeditiously and um, in the next few weeks I know Lee, you had your hand up earlier. And then... No, I'm dead. You're good? Yeah. Okay, so Lynn? Yeah, I want to address one other question that keeps coming up because unlike the Mass School Building Authority, the M Mass Board of Library Commissioners does not seek bids every year. It seeks bids every five or 10 years, and then it makes a decision about who it's going to award to that award money to from the list of approved projects that they've placed in priority, which as somebody mentioned earlier, we were ninth on the list. So when they approve your project, they're approving it on the grant application and the dollars that you submitted at that time. So part of the conundrum we're in is first of all, we were nine on the list. Then we delayed for another year because of the pandemic. And meantime, MBLC has not increased the amount that they will give us. Now, politically, there is some effort to try to see if that could happen. But right now we have to assume that they won't. And they are not through the list. They still have to finish off the existing list, which will take another two or three more years before they even go out to solicit a next round of bids. So I just want people to understand the cycle that MBLC uses versus the cycle the Mass um, School Building Authority uses. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy? Um, I, I th think this can be easily answered um, by Sean or else we'll put it on the list. So when you said, uh, Bernie was asking about how much has been dispersed from us of the grant, if we got to 2.7 and we have spent a half million of it, do we have to send the whole 2.7 back or do we send the unspent part of it back? All um, of it back. It, it all goes back. Yeah. Okay. So that would come out of the town's um, debt authorization, basically, at that point. Okay. Any any costs incurred? Okay. Lead. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that any cost incurred between now and the bid will be borne by the library. And you're trying to confirm that understanding? So. That's my understanding. Uh, Bob is here. 
I don't know if anybody else is here from the library, but that is my understanding. Uh, I'm not that, I don't believe there is any such agreement. Right. So the, the agreement that we have in place only contemplates a successful project. If so, if the project moves forward, then we would follow the existing agreement we have. Um, if there was for any reason the project didn't move forward, the current agreement we have doesn't really address that, um, which again is part of the reason why we're having this conversation. So right now it's um, not, I mean, right now it's the town that, that would be on the hook for the, for the next uh, two or three phases. So what I think that I would like to do then if we're getting to the right point is um, turn this over to Lynn to put up the questions of information that she has initially developed and um, as far as what we will want for our next discussion and um, start working on that document. And then I think that during that discussion, I'll probably want to open it up to attendees to allow attendees to participate because if attendees are suggesting things that we need to know to make a decision, which is really what this is about, um, that's a good time to have public comment on the subject. Um, but before we go there, I see there are a couple of hands up from current participants. Lee's still have your hand up and Bob Hegner. So Lee, is there anything else that you wanted to ask her? Lee? You're muted. So. Unmute. So it would be helpful if the trustees <laughs> voted to say that the trustees would carry the costs to the bid process. Am I hearing this correctly? Uh, Paul? Yeah, so I think um, if the trustees choose to do that, they would need to do that at a publicly posted meeting. And, Indeed. Yeah, and I think that that's an option for the trustees to offer that. Indeed it is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. One. Yeah. I like clarity. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, Bob. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't know what the whether this was the right time or not, but I'm I've been looking through the um, the agenda item and the uh, spreadsheet and the PowerPoint that uh, Lynn circulated earlier, and there's a a um, a spreadsheet in there that has a. a schematic design and its description of potential um, scope reductions. And then it's got a three columns, well, two columns possible and, or rejected. There's some that appear to be potential scope increases, which is called alternate. And then in later on in the PowerPoint, it talks about um, cost reduction. There, some are plausible, some are not plausible. I'm wondering, like, who's making what? Who makes who came up with these things, and who made the decision that they were plausible or not plausible, or that we might have even a scope addition? If I'm reading this correctly, if somebody could just walk through that, I, I'd appreciate it. I can start again, Sharon or Alex or Paul, hop in if you want to. So, so that's a document that the. Um, the building committee is reviewing with the owner's project manager and the designer. Um, they've helped put it together. Um, my understanding is the, the there's a sub design subcommittee of the, the building committee that is looking at these and helping identify whether they're plausible or not plausible. Um, you know, there's some some things that were there was sort of a brainstorming done. There was a value engineering process that was done with the cost estimators and again our designer and OPM to kind of list possible. Uh, modification to the scope, and then each of those had to be gone through to determine is it something we could actually do. Um, so, for example, you know there might have been one that would have reduced the energy efficiency of the building. Um, could it reduce the scope? Yes, but did, was it de uh, deemed plausible? Maybe not because it doesn't align with the goals of the project. Um, so that's an on again that's an ongoing process with the building committee um, right now. Okay. For those who are wondering, that's in the Jones Library Building Committee 
packet for August 23rd, I think it was the date, and it was one of the items that was included in the material that was uh, put together for the council for next month, next week's meeting. So that if you're looking for the, what Bob is just describing, that's where you find it. And I'll just add that I the conversation has at the committee level has definitely shifted from considering the alternates to more focused on the, the scope reduction. Some of those alternates were on there from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I would say there's not as much focus on that now, but we've kept them on that list just to document everything that's been considered. Yeah, thank you. Bernie? Are you muted? Or you're muted, Bernie. Nope. Still Good. muted, Bernie. You're still muted. You're muted. still muted. Okay, there we go. Um, press the button. Um, that's the document that Bob is referring to is also where I got the uh, the 2.7 uh, million grant disbursement. And I do want to just kind of reinforce what I, I believe Alex said earlier. Um, the the uh, repair costs have been escalated in that document. And I guess, uh, I would guess that what, what happened is they just simply got escalated by the percentage that the total construction costs got escalated. Um, so I would uh, uh, just kind of reiterate that I, I those uh, repair cost estimates are probably unreliable. Um, sure. Under working, uh, when you're working under existing conditions, there's a lot of other costs to come, in, come into play. So I, I think that we might want to focus on how those how those two uh, costs were escalated and uh, see what the methodology was. That's all. Thanks. I think you had, uh, Sean, you had cost escalations in your presentation before. Yeah, so the ones that Bernie's speaking to, I think were put together by the owner of project manager. Sharon, is that right? So I don't, I can't speak to that. Um, I don't know if he just used the same cost escalation that was being used for um, for the, the cost estimates for the construction project, the, the full project, um, but we can find out the answer to that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> So um, can we shift to the discussion about additional information that this committee thinks is important for the, our next meeting when we, have, when, when we take the next step of taking the information at hand and processing it? And if uh, that's agreeable, then I turn it over to Lynn. As we started preparing for this meeting, uh, questions arose uh, in my usual style. I tried to group them into similar questions about the same broad area. And so there are five categories. I'm sorry, there are four categories. No, there are five categories. I need to do some spacing here. Um, the first is about the endowment. The second is regarding construction costs. And I think uh, I wanna just specifically say to um, others that this, this is one of those areas where if you wanted to ask a question about the document that was used at the Board of Library Trustees meeting a week ago, this would be a place to put those. The next area is regarding fundraising. The fourth area is regarding historic tax credits. And the fifth area is regarding repair versus renovation and addition. I just want to say up front, as with any document that I label as draft, I'm not offended if people feel like they needed to change wording, but we're not here to wordsmith there. We're here to see what additional questions we want to make sure the trustees ask. This was in your packet and it was sent to all counselors, including those that are in the audience uh, prior to, uh, it was sent yesterday. 
Okay. Now here's the problem. I can't see raised hands. So Andy, you're going to have to handle that. Okay. Um, I will do that. But uh, before I do that, could somebody check uh, to see if Alicia's got it was accidentally moved to the audience and if she needs to be brought back in? And uh, Kathy, recognize you well. Somebody else is. Yeah, she's she's not in the she's not in the audience, Andy. Um, she's back. Okay. So. Okay. Thanks. Um. So I, I'll look at the construction costs one document Bob was looking at, Lynn, but I want to ask it interactively with the historic tax credit. So it may be an additional question. Um, on One of the things on the list of a potential cut that I think everyone decided against was slate roof on historic Jones versus not slate roof. So to um, my understanding of to the extent I understand the historic tax credits at all, um, so let's preface it with that, is that it, the idea is that you're renovating a historic building and doing as much restoration. So um, are there cuts that we might be considering that would put the historic tax credit at risk at all? Um, so that's, a, that's why I said it's an interactive, because um, I'm not sure what part of the inside of Jones we were talking about moving around. Um, so that, and then the last, um, the other one with that, Lynn, is my memory from the last time around is that um, it says final determination coming at the end of the project. And I think Bob as treasurer, um, one of the things that putting the endowment at risk was that we might not get those tax credits you know, in year one, when the library opens, but we thought we'd get them in year two or three. So just do we get them after it's finished? So someone looks at what we actually did and what's the lag on them. Um, so you have it accumulated when the final determined end of project. So I just want to know, is that like building is built and two years later, someone decides whether we've got these credits because we have to earn them and then someone has to buy them from the bank so we get them so I just and this interacts um, in my mind with the security of the endowment you know that we thought when it was the 36 million dollar project we could get a, take a short-term hit of a couple million dollars so we never envisioned taking an eight million dollar an eight and a half million dollar hit so I'm just so I just want that interaction with historic credits with anything being careful on construction cost savings that we don't jeopardize those credits. And then when when might we receive them? Hey, Andy, this is Alex. I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand and I can't see anything. So my hand is okay. up and then you can call on me whenever you want. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry. That, uh... You can only do what you're doing. I've been in this situation too with participating by phone. It's been, uh, but in any of uh, so speak up. We are trying to at this point focus on the questions of what information that um, should be provided to the committee and the council for our next discussion. And um, so that's where I'm looking for right now. I don't know if you have anything you want to put into that discussion now. I, I was just going to answer Kathy's questions. Well, I Is think it, at this well, point, in, in trying the, to okay. avoid getting into the answers to the questions now and focus just on what the questions are, because uh, this isn't the only meeting. So in, okay. uh, the, question, the questions are answered in the original finance document that so many of those questions were answered previously and exist, but we can certainly do it again. I think, Alex, the issue that we're uh, dealing with is there's a lot of paper associated with the project. Yep. And we're aware that some of these questions have been answered previously. Uh, but because yep. we have six new counselors out of 13, it's important yep. that we help uh, bring all of that information forward on this one. Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, Lynn, I'll let you take back over. Um, 
but uh, just so you know, Bob, anybody named Bob, Bob Kim and Bob Hegner both have their hands up. <laughs> my picture is higher. <clears throat> so I'm willing to wait if, if Bob wants to speak. Okay, um, I understand that you're trying to avoid answering questions at this moment, um, <clears throat> but it is worth recognizing that in the, the first area, which is really my area, the endowment and, and the budget, <clears throat> when you ask, what are we going to have for our budget for the next five years, that is predicting the future. Um, we can tell you what our policies are. We can tell you what it has been for the last five years. We can tell you um, what we would like it to be, um, but <clears throat> the reality is that <clears throat> uh, the amount that we can draw from the endowment depends upon what the market does. And for example, um, all of the numbers that you have seen recently are based upon the value of the endowment as of July 31st. Uh, that was $8.6 million. As of September 2nd, it's $8.2 million. It changes from month to month. It changes from year to year. Um, and so <clears throat> making the prediction you would like over the next five years is hard. It's true. Thank you. Or should we let the other Bob? Uh... Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was uh, up. Um, this is, uh, I want to phrase this question. I, I was suggesting we add it to the construction costs. And I, I want to phrase it carefully because I don't want people to misinterpret it. But I understand that the um, energy efficiency goals for the project are to reduce the EUI down to like 29 or something like that. The current library is somewhere in the 40 or 50 range. Um, and my experience has been that it usually costs a lot more to get the last 10% or the last 20% than it does to get the first 80%. So I'm wondering how much could cost be reduced if we change the target, instead of the target being 29, maybe 35, maybe, I don't know what the right number would be, but it it's just seems, I, I think it would be important information to have to know, you know, what's gonna, how much, how much does it cost to get us 80% of the way to the target, to the target versus 100%. And then within that, how much of that is something that could be addressed over time? In other words, we may not be able to change windows or maybe we could change windows or could we change insulation or I mean, it just seems to me that it would be important to know what we, what we have to do in order to get to the EUI target and then back off from there and see what we're trading off in terms of 29 versus 35 versus 40 or something like that. So I, I just think it's an important piece of information for uh, the, the council to know. Andy, if, if if I'm if I might just offer up one comment to Rob's com Bob's comment. Yes, but remember we we are focusing on trying yes. to solve the questions. But go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to help with the crafting of the question that's being asked. So the um the the project was given an EUI of and I don't have anything in front of me. Let's say it's 34 or 36. And then there were additional conservation measures that got us to 29. So that differential is, is an easy number to be provided. But anything beyond that, we actually paid, again, I don't have the number in front of me, but I want to say like $30,000, $40,000 to 
you actually have to have somebody go in, design a plan, and do the energy modeling. So it would be easy to answer the question of sort of the cost of the additional energy measures from the base building, but to go beyond that, we'd have to pay somebody to do that. So I just want to offer up that information in case people want to phrase the question differently or just know that. You're muted, Bob. I think, I'm sorry. I think that would be helpful. And since it's, you already have that information, I don't want to cause, you know, another $40,000 costs. <laughs> um, but I think that would just be useful information for people to have. Yeah, I'm doing this, saying this because uh, uh, Lynn, since she's sharing her screen, can't see whose hands are up. Uh, Lynn, Kathy, Alicia, and Michelle have their hands up at the moment. So mine, mine is just quick building on Bob's, um, Lynn, in the same area. And Alex can confirm this. Um, they have a uh, going to all electric. They have an electricity cost of the building, if you know that's linked with the EUI. So if you look at the higher EUI, does the operating cost of the building go up? Um, so it's a separate, it's a linked question, Lynn. You know, so if we, I don't want to save fifty thousand dollars and spend twenty, or you know, I just because now we've got a building that's leaking heat or leaking air conditioning um so it just i just wanted to qualify that a little bit because i know in the school building we're we're looking at the interaction of the two we're making a building that's going to be much less expensive to operate um because because we're insulating it so well you know forget on the way we're running it it's yeah thank you i guess alicia's next Um, thank you. So my first question was actually very similar to Kathy's, so I will skip that one. Um, <clears throat> my other question was um, if, so uh, like earlier in July, we had a presentation on the capital projects um, that Sean presented to us. And I was wondering if there has been an updated analysis on the impact of these changes to our whole capital plan and then on the town, like, budget and operating budget or anything that it may impact as well. So should I go ahead and call in Michelle or do you want to wait, have her wait a second? Oh, sorry. Could could you all not hear me? No, we did. I'm I'm typing. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure. And I I actually just put it down in its own separate category because it's really not a question that the library trustees would ask, but it's a question that Sean and Paul would have to answer. Okay. okay. Lynn, just Thank you. the other the other words uh, Alicia had was operating, so it's the capital plan and operating budget. So, you know, if yes. You know, so if in example, if the endowment wasn't available for the operating budget, what does that do to the town? What to so you got it. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Kathy. Yep, got it. So, so I I don't know if um, Andy, if you can create a separate time for us to do this, or if I can just go ahead with it now. But I have some process questions slash concerns is this a time that i might be able to address those i definitely uh, think we should move with that andy you want you want to create a section on process questions so and then let I did. forward and ask tell us what the questions are oh are, are is that are you ready for yeah. that <laughs> okay. i am just want to make sure I'm in the right segment here. All right. So um, one of the concerns that I'm feeling as we're working through this discussion is making decisions that are piecemeal and separate. So I think this is like a big puzzle. It's very complex, as Andy said. And 
for example, when I'm thinking through if for whatever reasons this project doesn't move forward, um, there are still necessary and immediate repairs that need to be made. So who would be responsible for the cost of those repairs? How quickly would those repairs be able to be made? Um, and so for me, I can't make decisions without really understanding the full scope of all of the impacts. Um, and I also wouldn't want to make decisions separate from the trustees necessarily. So from a process perspective, I would appreciate that as many of the meetings as we have around this, that we're opening them up as um, meetings of the full council and with the trustees as much as we can within the confines of open meeting law. Um, I'm also concerned about the communication with the public with respect to the process. Um, I'm seeing all sorts of stuff flying around in all sorts of locations. And I think it would be um, good on us to somehow find a way to express to the public uh, clearly what this process is. Lynn, when I received your email, it was extremely helpful as always. Um, but how can we get that information out to the public and ask for patience as we work through this process so that there's not, uh, you know, someone picking up one little nugget of something and then that becomes the full narrative, you know. Um, and then uh, there are a lot of experts in the room um, and I'm also wondering if there's anyone else that we should be seeking professional input from um, in making uh, this very complex decision and uh, understanding really the impacts that all of these decisions have on our budget and on our community. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any further hands up from people who are currently panelists in the meeting. And um, oh, I guess Bob's hand is up and I, I'll complete what I'm about to say and then uh, uh, see what, um, and, and then yes, recognize Bob. But um, I had said that uh, when we got to this stage that I would find the point um, and that I'm getting close to it where um, public comment about the library discussion would be in order. We did we do post public comment at all meetings. And I wanted to get public comment in after we've had some, some discussion to inform the public comment, but um, I recognize that the public may raise questions that then the committee would might want to add to the list. And so I will be, going to the attendees uh, in a moment for to see who would like to uh, participate and speak on the library. Um, so, uh, but Mr. Pam. Bob, you have to unmute. Sorry to speak again. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that it is worth at least talking through what the decision points are. Um, it is conceivable that um, after thinking about this over the next 30 to 60 days, a decision will be made. <clears throat> if that is so, um, and it is in favor of proceeding, then that is fine. If the decision is not to go forward, then that would be a point at which we need to really have an answer to the question that I think Michelle asked, which is, is the town willing to specify anything about the scope and timing of needed repairs in the event that the project does not proceed? <clears throat> um, if that is not the point that occurs, then the, really the next decision point is in a year's time, at which point a full design will exist, bids will have been um, solicited and bids will come back. That will then allow two things to be known. One is what will the project actually cost? And two, um, what kind of money has been raised? 
if the answer to those are favorable, then presumably the town would go forward. If those answers are not favorable, then presumably the town will then make whatever decision is appropriate. So the, really we're talking about two decision points. One is immediate and one is a year from now. <clears throat> and that is important to, to think about in terms of what is the process here. Um, in terms of other questions, one of the things that has been raised as a possibility is that um, the Commonwealth itself will, in the face of the kind of construction inflation which has occurred, rethink its policy with respect not only to libraries, but to schools and whatever other construction projects are involved. And it would be worthwhile to keep track of where that is. I don't think any decisions are gonna be made on that immediately. The legislature is not in session, but there's clearly going to be efforts in that direction. And that is something that we ought to be at least tracking and paying attention to. <clears throat> um, there is another point which is, um, and it was raised, but not specific. And that is that in order to produce a affordable project, um, there are items which are no longer in the scope and you should know what items have been dropped from the scope. Um, <clears throat> and finally, there is the question of timing. Um, the way the um, resolution is written by the council, it basically says that the council has authorized the town to spend the money with the understanding that dollars will come back from <clears throat> the MBLC and from the library and portions will come through CPA. Um, the reality of it in terms of the construction is that um, that will mean advancing substantial sums of money during the course of construction to be refunded at the conclusion of construction when the last one or two payments, sorry, my voice is gone. <clears throat> last one or two payments from the MBLC occurs and when the uh, historic tax credits have been finalized and can then be sold, all of which occurs after completion. So somebody is putting up the money in between and you just have to be reasonably clear about how much that is. Thank you. Then do you need any clarification or? Nope. Okay. Um, I see no one else from the Committee of the Trustees who's currently a panelist who's asked to uh, participate. So what I'm going to do is go to the attendees. This is- So uh, Andy, what I would like to do is take this down while we do that and then come back to it if we need to. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, because what we're gonna, what public comment is, is it's, um, while I, it may inform the questions that we have posed, um, it uh, is not necessarily tied to it. Um, so public comment can really, doesn't just need to be on information to be gathered, um, it, but it is, but what I would like to do is have, um, just public comment right now on the question of the library, because I'll do a second public comment later in the meeting when we uh, are getting onto the regional schools and any other issues that people wish to bring to the finance committee. Dorothy Pam's hand is up. I don't know if there are anybody else who wishes to speak on the library, but Dorothy, um, I guess uh, somebody needs to bring you in so that you can, uh, make your comment or ask your question.
Okay. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the material that was sent, but today was my first class of the semester, and I have barely had a chance to read them, and I certainly haven't had a chance to read any of the mail that has come in on this topic. But um, you're asking about questions. I have questions that aren't ever even brought up, and, and I'm getting very frustrated about it. Um, so number one, from the beginning, has the catchment area for the project always been the and this is approximate the 51,000 and not the uh, number of actual year time year round residents for the town of Amherst, which is, I think, maybe 38,000 or although I've heard it was like 19,000. So I'm not sure, but I know there's two numbers. Has it always been that big? And number two, are you planning to ask the MBLC to reduce that number so that we can then reduce the footprint and the program? Because currently they will not allow us or anyone else who receives their money to do so, um, and what would happen, uh, and would we be worse off if we returned the 13 million, which no longer, given the new price increases, it no longer looks like that much money, um, and it's like a tight corset holding us in and not allowing us to make changes that could make this a good project. Um, is that going to be, um, would be able to just give that money back and then go ahead and see what I realize the cost we have for the, the repair is probably not an accurate cost. I think that's been made today. And so we want to know what would be the accurate cost of a thorough repair and upgrade of the existing building. Um, certainly, you know, there's a great outpouring of support for the library, but there's a, a fear uh, of pledging the endowment. And uh, I don't, I'm not a financial person. I don't follow the ins and outs. But I know that if the endowment is not there to use as a swing space uh, fund when the money comes in and the money doesn't come in, and if it's not there for the um, to earn money, um, to produce the money they, uh, that is used to help spend most of the operating costs of the library, then we're in deep trouble. So I, I know that that is upsetting. So my question really has, can we, has the number always been that big? Can we reduce that number? Can the MBL be... MBLC give permission to, if they won't give more money, and I tell you, I think that's pie in the sky. Everybody wants more money and the costs keep going up. I think the state would be, if they give more money, it'll be just a little dibble dab here, a couple of million here and there. We're not talking about a couple million more than we need. Um, so will they be open to negotiate at some point? And if not, would we be worse off if we returned that money and made a realistic estimate, which I realize will be money. Will It will cost to fix and repair the library to the state that it should be in. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the attendees who wishes, uh, Shalini, uh, just bring her in. Um, just we should probably, as this happens, because Anna's hand is up, we should remove the people we brought in. Otherwise, Lynn will suddenly be at quorum. Yes, I think that's a good point. Thank you. Shall we? Yes, hi. Um, I think uh, um, my first question is, seeing the graph that Sean presented to us, it looked like the town's amount of contribution is not increasing. And so is this a question then for the town manager or, I mean, maybe this is a very obvious answer, but somehow I'm, like, if this is not involved increasing the amount, then is this a decision that the town manager needs to make? Or is this a decision that the town council needs to make? Um, that's number one. And I ask that also just because of the timing of is of essence. And the reason we are having this decision is because in the past, the project has been pushed forward. And my fear is in having these meetings, which I understand is important, but at the same time, we are continuing to add to the costs. Um, so that's number one. And the second question, I believe Michelle has um, mentioned that, but I'll just uh, emphasize again, that if we are, if the council is gonna engage in this conversation, then, um, it is important to also then uh, discuss what is the plan if you don't go ahead 
in terms of you know the plan for returning the payment with the interest and the plan for hiring a design consultant for the repairs the h h v a c h vac and everything else like what is going to happen that and of course i'm again concerned the deeper we go into these discussions the more we are delaying so again process which again michelle mentioned i think is of essence can we streamline this and be very effective in our decision in a deliberation what are the questions we're asking and staying focused on uh, what is important right now is the cost and the fundraising my again also to people who are watching and we've already discussed this project has been going on for so many years and when last round the council voted and then uh, the questions went out to the residents which two thirds of the residents who voted supported it. A lot of the initial questions that are coming up now have been addressed or at least answered. And I think the focus now has to be on the increased costs and uh, the fundraising and uh, other alternatives that we're hearing about like grants and the legislative support and all of that. That need to be the focus. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Hana, Hana. Andy, I was stuck in the ether. Did you call on me? Yes. Sorry. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, happy elect primary day. So, uh, two, two quick things. First is, and these are both, I recognize partly questions for, um, the folks leading the fundraising efforts, but I wanted to bring them to the table as well here, because I believe these, the people in this room right now would be deeply involved to some extent. Uh, I'd like to know what other state and federal funding opportunities have been pursued for this project and especially revisited if they were pursued before, um, as we've gotten increased numbers. I know that this is the fundraising question, but I assume, um, or I'd like to ensure that these are, are pursued to every extent possible. And then the second part of that question that dovetails it is that I'd, I'd like to know how we can, or I'd like to talk through how we can work with our state legislators to pressure the MBLC to allocate additional funds to existing projects, either instead of adding new, uh, new awards in future years, given that I know we're not alone in, in our project cost rising. And I believe that the MBLC needs to be paying attention to that and, um, be tuned into those conversations and consider how they can ensure that the projects they deemed worthy get done. Uh, I think that they have some responsibility there and, and we need to make sure that we are um, creating some accountability for them in that process. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, um, are you yeah. getting this done to in a I, way? I am, and but I also wanna just mention that um, as outlined in the two long emails sent on Sunday. Uh, this is the first discussion for the finance committee and the council will have a similar opportunity on Monday the 12th. And then we will work to get some answers uh, either that because they exist already or we need to try to find them or frankly, getting the cost of getting those answers is prohibitive. And I think in a couple of instances, we have that. But I just want to make sure that this is not the only time uh, for the public or counselors to ask questions. Thank you. Okay, and Kathy. Uh, thanks. Um, no, th this is just to embellish, Lynn, on some of the questions we already have on. And I think Anna was, you know, we may want to re rearrange the order, but we're, we're similarly going to federal and state on the elementary school budget, trying to see what we can relieve. Um, to what extent are we going to the same pool? Um, <laughs> or, you know, and, and uh, you know, if, if we as a council, as a town need to make tough choices um, and we're trying to dip into the same, uh, get a piece in, or are there really different, some potentially different funding streams that we wouldn't be on, you know, asking for the same um, when we do that. And then on the uh, Bob's decision points um, and, and Michelle's of, if we didn't move forward, I'd like some, I'm gonna use the wrong term, but um, 
and I know how painful it would be for people who have worked on this project, um, can we as a town and the trustees kind of turn on a dime saying, let's get a really good number on the repair and fix the library because there's a slot in our budget already for 16 million, you know, in capital. Um, so I'm not saying it's the same money, but um, uh, not let the building fall apart. And could we get a proposal back to us in, where, well, what are we in September? Could we have any chance of getting a proposal back in the spring of 2023, you know, just soon rather than wait a year so that we could be on a similar construction path um, to, to move forward. What Alex said, we didn't have a full plan B, we had a, a partial plan B and we had some designer fees in that 14 million. You know, we had some, but there wasn't a plan. Um, so I just, it's that timeline issue of um, what are we on a collision course with um, at state, federal and our own budgets. So Lynn, you've, you've got all those questions, but I'm not sure it comes across when we're looking at um, DPW. I think you're the one who told me we are at risk. We can't repair the roof because the walls can't hold a roof. And so the building is in such bad shape that we have one that's actually potentially going to fall apart. Um, so we've got two other big projects. So we're on a, we have to, as a council, kind of step up and look at the whole thing because these, we only have so many tax dollars. Um, so I just, I want to just put that in some framework. There's not a lot of little isolated questions, but there's some biggies that we, the council, have to be thinking about. Thank you. Thanks. And yes, Andy, I am taking notes. Okay. Because I think I, I want to, uh, we spend a lot of time in library and I want to uh, draw to a close so we can get to our one other major topic for today, even though it will not take as long as this one did by any means. Um, so Lynn, do you feel comfortable with the list of questions that you have? I don't think you need to bring it back to the show us now. Yes, I very much appreciate it. And uh, do not send uh, emails to all counselors with your questions, but you can send them to me. Thank you. We do not want to be in a email debate. Okay. So I don't know, Sharon or any of the trustees, if you have any final comments before we, because I think we're at this point today closing out the discussion and we'll return to it um, at the next finance committee meeting, which we will hopefully schedule very soon. Yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you all. Um, you know, as many of you said, this is really complex, not only for the library making that decision, but also for the town. And, you know, the trustees and I absolutely understand <laughs> this beast uh, of, a, of a puzzle. And I just really appreciate it. it's a boatload of work. And we all thought we had been over this bridge. Um, but here we are again. So thank you all. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, I would, so I want to again thank you and uh, the trustees who took the time this afternoon to join us because uh, it is a complicated issue and as Lynn pointed out we have close to half the council that was not involved in the prior discussion and um, but will be dis involved in the next discussion. We needed to have this opportunity to start bringing everybody onto the same place. And so your help in doing that is very valuable and very much appreciated. Thank you. So anything else? Otherwise, I think that we will um, uh, thank our uh, library um, trustees and staff for being here and move on. And Sean is going to briefly talk about um, and explain what happened at the, uh, the the meeting of the regional school organized around what was called guardrails, but it was really bigger than guardrails, um, and um, then answer questions about that. I don't think we have any decisions that need to be made today, but it was um, the most recent meeting, and so it's important to get a report on that. 
we will do one final um, round of public comment. If there is any, uh, try and set a next meeting date. We are not going to do minutes at this meeting. Um, and uh, Athena is working with us to get the minutes ready so that we can actually have them to all of you in advance of the next meeting and clean up the minutes at the next meeting. Um, so with that, Sean. Thanks, Sandy. I'll try to be relatively brief. Um, so we met, I think it was last Monday with um, different uh, members of each of each member town uh, to review this guardrail concept. Um, so what we're talking about is the regional assessment method and how the regional school district allocates its budget to each of the, the four member towns. Um, and so the concept they wanted to look at would be to put a 4% guardrail, um, which is basically a cap or a floor on assessment increases for individual towns. Um, and, and they expressed that they wanted to look at that because they heard some feedback from, um, I'm not sure exactly who, but some at four town meetings that um, maybe we're worried about really large increases in assessments. Um, so again, what this basically does is it um, would limit any, any town's increase in a given year to 4%. Um, and likewise, if that town was gonna see a savings in their assessment, it would limit the savings to 4%. Um, so on the on the high side, it would it would protect the town, but it would limit any you know if the, the assessment method called for a higher percentage increase, that difference would come out of the region budget. They basically would reduce how much revenue they brought in. Um, and on the flip side, if you know a town was going to save six percent instead of saving six percent, they'd only save four, and that difference would be an increase to the regional budget. So um, kind of works on both sides. The uh, school finance director, Dr. Um, Slaughter, showed us some different models um, of what it would look like um, using historical data. The method we're on now is a, is a mixture of a five-year average of enrollment and a five-year average of minimum contributions, which is a, a complicated concept the state uses to determine the wealth of a community. Um, so we're using sort of dual five-year averages. And, and so we looked back and mapped out um, what it would look like for each town if we were on this model using the using the guardrails. Um, I, you know, Lynn or Andy or Lynn, jump in if you feel like I'm characterizing this wrong. But I think my takeaway is that um, sort of the initial feedback was to the concept was mixed. Um, I think we kind of conveyed that a four percent guardrail wouldn't really work for the town of Amherst because our budget guidance is usually between two and three percent, usually around two and a half. Um, and so 4% would be really difficult to achieve without making major reductions somewhere else. Um, and also when we looked at the data that was sort of mapped out, Amherst is never at a 4% increase or decrease. So um, so we weren't sure how those guardrails would actually work in conjunction with Amherst. Um, and then at least one official from another town expressed some concern around the guardrails and that he'd wanna look at it closer. Um, kind of the same thing that, you know, if a town's assessment should go down 6%, you know, shouldn't that town actually benefit from that. Um, so I think the, the major takeaway was that all four towns will go back and talk to their um, their respective you know, finance committees and select boards and, and town councils and kind of get feedback to, to report back to the region. Um, the, you know, the, the bigger concern that I think we saw from the numbers that Andy sort of alluded to is that in the chart that Dr. Slaughter provided um, in the out years of assessments, Amherst was the largest uh, assessment increase, and, um, not in terms of dollars, but in terms of percentage um, and dollars, but more importantly, in terms of percentage, we were seeing assessment increases ranging from about 2.6% to 3.38. Again, these are all hypothetical, so I wouldn't get stuck on those, but just the, the relative nature of the, how the towns are sort of organized. Um, we were the high increase where some of the, the where all the other towns were lower. Um, many were seeing decreases in those years. And that's just a difficult, difficult dynamic. Um, it's, you know, obviously one of the things I dealt with when I worked for the regional schools is that, you know, one town goes up, if other towns go down, it actually impacts how much overall money goes to the region and it poses some awkward um, just dynamics to how the assessment method works. Um, so I think that's something that, again, as uh, Amherst officials, we're going to have to keep an eye on during this budget process, how this new method, which we've only been on for one year, you know, what we see this coming year, this will be the second year where we can compare, um, you know, what it, what it 
how, what is our assessment increase, but also what are the other town's assessment increases and does that um, sort of meet the needs of, of Amherst, but also the regional schools. Um, so in terms of next steps, again, I think our mission is to get feedback from you all and, and report back to the region at some point at another working group meeting. And we'll probably, we have a BCG meeting scheduled um, for two or three weeks from now, um, where we might discuss the other issue about just the assessment method that we're on and what impacts we foresee um, this for this budget cycle coming up. And with that, report over. Yeah, let me just mention that um, Mandy Johanneke, myself, Paul, Sean, and Anna, who is in the audience, uh, attended this meeting. Sean, I think you did an excellent job of summarizing it. And as much as they kept saying, well, Amherst will pay what it can pay, that's not what the chart says. And so it continues to concern us that somehow or another, they think we could either, we could move as high as 4% increase in any budget year. And that just is not supported by our history. So we were very clear during the conversation that for Amherst, this was, we were diplomatic about it, but we were clear um, that this was um, not a method that works for us. Uh, since Paul's not having it, you know, um, Kathy? Um, yeah, I just have a question. And if it's in materials, you can, and you can point me where to look. Um, you framed it around 4%. Did you look at 3%? So was there, did Doug produce charts with a different guardrail or was everything framed in four? As I only I only saw four percent. I think it was that okay. was the um, yeah. concept that they're proposing based on the the data that they put together. Okay, it, so you answered my question. So I just my mind right away goes. So what's the alternative? You know, if we, um, you know, to to cap it, and then the other piece it, are any of the towns in the regional agreement at the total limit of two and a half. So are they capped out? No. Nobody's nobody's capped out. Okay. No. Thank you. No, all the tax we looked at this somewhat recently. All all the tax rates are in the, you know, between 20 and 22, I think, for the okay. current year. Um yeah. Michelle. Uh does anyone know if the meeting was recorded? And if it was, would somebody be so kind as to send it? I'd like to take a I'd like to watch it. Yeah, we can ask um we can ask the it was on uh, the region's platform, Google um, Hangout Google. or something like that. Yeah. Um, so we can ask them if they have a recording that can be shared. Anything else? I, I guess, Andy, I'm, I'm sorry, Andy, I should raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think, if anything, we just have to continue to drive home the fact that history does not support Amherst being able to exceed the guidelines that we give to all other departments. And that that has to continue to be our message. And I do wanna emphasize from, as Sean pointed out, there was actually one of the smaller towns who said, they're not sure they really like this method either, so. Yeah, I mean, I had a concern looking at the spreadsheets that um, the amount that was being factored in for annual increases for uh, that, that was being factored in for annual increases for the regional school assessments, whether it was large enough to take care of the expected increase just to get maintain level services or whether this um, it would require additional cuts or put pressure on towns to increase and in particular whether it would put pressure on Amherst to increase and uh, you know Sean and I talked about that a little bit but that's sort of the piece that I'm looking at um, also is um, 
how this factors into the schools and whether it could come back to put pressure on us to do more than we can afford to do. This is very difficult times. So I don't know if there's anything else to be said on it at this point, but I did want to at least have a couple of minutes to get a brief report and see if there were questions. Seeing none uh, and knowing that it's 10 minutes to five and that we try and get in. Uh, if there are other members of the public who are in the attendee group who would like to speak on any issue now that's before the finance committee, uh, I had limited it to libraries before, but I wanna open it up for any other issues that members of the public, please raise your hand and let us know so that we can bring you in and allow you to make the public comment consistent with um, what our policy and best practice is. Seeing no request for public comment, um, that leaves us with one question, which is uh, trying to schedule a next meeting for this committee. And um, I think that what I would like to do is at least see if there are any um, periods which are not available, and then maybe we need to do this by some kind of doodle poll rather than to try and do it right at this instant but we do need to get a meeting probably within the next 10 days um but on the outer score that lynn i just want to mention that alicia cannot meet until three o'clock uh, on any any work day okay Yeah, that is, thank you for sharing that since I'm not sure that she's in the meeting at the moment. Um, so are there any particular days that, or times that people are unavailable that we need to avoid? And, if, and then beyond that, I think what we're gonna do is uh, get to a doodle poll quickly so that we can hear from everybody. Yeah. Andy, can I just ask, is there a reason we wouldn't just meet next Tuesday at three? I mean, maybe you need to do a doodle poll, but um, I, in my calendar, I tend to always protect Tuesday afternoons. So I don't know whether that, I had kind of, that's my, that's when finance meets in my mind, <laughs> um, all the way through Christmas or New Year's or whatever. <laughs> You know, that's my, I don't know what weeks we're meeting, but that's my slot. So I don't know whether other people feel that way about it, but it's kind of a protected time slot. I don't mind a doodle poll, I should say, but I'm yeah. just. Is there anybody who objects to at least freezing in Tuesday at three o'clock? Because then we're getting down to um, a much narrower question, which is, next Tuesday, which would be the day after the council meeting or a week later. It would be probably then have to be one of those two dates. The, the biggest problem we have is we don't have another council meeting until October. We have one on the 19th and then we don't have another one until October 3rd. And that uh, I, as much as this is a huge decision. Um, it's also one that the more we put it off, the more it costs. So we really, I mean, when I said either next week, the 13th or the 20th or the two dates we're talking about. So does anybody have a problem with either of those dates? Lynn, do you have a preference uh, between the 13th and the 20th? I prefer the 13th. I prefer the 13th. The, the only thing I would raise is if there's any additional requests for information that come up on the 12th, that we would you know, just be mindful that it might be difficult to have it ready for the 13th um, if we wanted to have all those answers together for that finance committee meeting. Well, 
Yeah, I, pre I prefer the 13th with, with the caveat that Sean said that we won't have answers from the night before, but um, but for my schedule, the 13th works better. Okay, sounds like the 13th is what the consensus is. So we will I mean, notice. The... I just had a thought that if, if we had questions and they were really critical, we could meet again on the 20th maybe. Yeah, I. Uh, no, I mean, we could meet on the thirteenth, but we could, we could have a a second meeting on the twentieth if there were questions that came up on the twelfth that were, you know, critical drivers. Right, and I, I mean, I'm going to try to be as regularly in touch with the library trustees um, to get the answers to. These questions, they already have seen the preliminary draft. Um, and as we know, several were with us today. So um, I think where we are is, is the plan right now is that we will notice meeting for the 13th. So uh, we'll be noticing it fairly quickly. The predominant discussion will be on this um, topic of uh, Continuing the library discussion. Uh, Lynn, are you going to let uh, Sharon and company know uh, what what the schedule is? Um, we will try and get the minutes straightened out for the night so that they're, they're available quickly or as many of them as possible available quickly. And then we can um, approve a bunch of minutes at the next meeting do that uh, very efficiently, hopefully. Um, is there anything else that people would like to raise at this point? Anything that was not anticipated? Okay, well, that, then I uh, thank you. It's been a uh, productive, difficult meeting, but uh, I think we really did a lot of progress and uh, I will try and uh, do some sort of report for the council just to let them know um, how we proceeded today and it will focus really on process um, it's not going to be talking about any recommendation because we don't have any we haven't gotten that far yet in the process so i thank you and i guess uh, at this point we're adjourned